The very First Amendment of the United States of America is about expressing ideas and spreading information without the interference of the government. The freedom of, of press lets journalists report on injustices and relay the truth to the American people without governmental action. And this was done because pre-Declaration of Independence, the British would regulate the media and eradicate any information they did not approve of. It's like having parental locks on your television to make sure the kids don't watch porn or anything made by Tyler Perry. But the revolution was basically the idea that we broke the TV and discovered the internet and watched all the porn. I mean, we still tried to refrain from Tyler Perry, though, but although the Tyler Perry porn is uh, surprisingly good, you know, very, very heartfelt. But it looks like America is taking cues from the British in the 1600s by suppressing real journalism recently. On October 25th, 2019, Max Blumenthal, editor of The Gray Zone Project, was arrested by a SWAT team over false charges. These charges were five months old, claiming Blumenthal assaulted a pro-Venezuelan coup protester, a charge that was rejected due to lack of evidence. So at 9 a.m., the D.C. police lived out their dreams of being in a Denzel Washington action movie, by threatening to break down Max Blumenthal's door and take him out. I think we can all say that King Kong literally didn't have shit on Blumenthal, considering the warrant they had on him was based on nothing. They kept him in, a, in multiple cells for two days and denied him his rightful phone call and an attorney. Apparently, during the raids, uh, the DC police also slapped Miranda in the mouth and told her to stay silent. I mean, in the era of hashtag me too, they should really have more respect for Miranda and her rights. The assault charges came about when Blumenthal and a variety of other protesters came to support the Venezuelan embassy protectors with food and sanitary items and then were met with violence by pro-coup protesters as well as the Secret Service police. The violence got so bad that a Secret Service police member brutally attacked Jerry Condon of Veterans for Peace. I suppose the only way to suppress peace is through overwhelming violence. At this point, no corporate or mainstream journalism outlet has spoken out about Blumenthal's arrest, which I find is no real surprise, right? Considering these corporate news outlets didn't support Chelsea Manning or Julian Assange, when they just used the material that they revealed as news anyway. They also marked Edward Snowden as a traitor when he handed his findings to journalist Glenn Greenwald of The Intercept. They just toe the line of being informants for the corporate cause. They want to feed you curated information from the government approved by the state to so divide not just in the American political landscape, but also in your mind. And the divide in, in your mind is between propaganda served by a member of the minority community and your own critical thinking skills. So why did Max Blumenthal get arrested so abruptly on clearly very false charges from a biased source? Well, the day before the arrest, the Gray Zone Project had revealed that the USAID had been funding the representatives of the Venezuelan coup like Juan Guaido, the protesters, and Carlos Vecchio. The United States Agency for International Development is a government organization that helps deliver and facilitate foreign aid for civilians and development projects. They've been funding the coup in Venezuela. I'm sure there's some folks wa wondering out there, who is Juan Guaido and Carlos Vecchio? And Americans aren't the only one. Less than 20% of Venezuelans know who Guaido was. Yet, Guaido proclaimed himself to be the new interim president of Venezuela after a call from Vice President Pence. You know, I 
can't just go out into the streets of Pittsburgh and proclaim that I am the king of all comedians because I got a call from a distant relative that told me they enjoyed a YouTube video of mine from five years ago. After Guaido's declaration, the Washington Post, Bloomberg, and other corporate media organizations championed Guaido's push to regain Venezuela's democracy. Uh, wait, uh, uh, what? Wait, wait, wait. Does the corporate media of America think democracy is just someone proclaiming their presidency with zero votes cast for them? Is this why the Washington Post thinks that democracy dies in the dark? Because voting boots are kind of dimly lit? Someone please, please go get these people a middle school civics book and just hand it to them. Canada and many other European nations did not back Guaido and recognize Maduro as the legally elected leader of Venezuela. Now America doubled down on their support for Guaido, especially since he was groomed and made for a coup, just like the very first Terminator was, uh, well, intended to terminate. And technically Guaido was built to terminate democracy in a sovereign nation. He was more popular within the inner circle of uh, Washington insiders than with anybody else, right? Which should immediately be like a red flag to anyone thinking that this coup is legitimate. Both Vecchio and Guaido are a favorite of Republicans like Marco Rubio and Democrats like Washington Schultz and Nancy Pelosi. And it goes to show that when it comes to money, it doesn't matter what party you belong to because the price, price tag has always been there. It shows us that these parties are one of the same. They're the party of imperialism and regime change. Carlos Vecchio was a lawyer that worked for the Petroleum of Venezuela, or PDVSA. Now, he was good with his position until Chavez decided to socialize the company and take charge of Venezuelan oil exports to financially benefit the people of his country. Vecchio became a legal counsel over at Exxon in 1994, a job that fully paid for a scholarship at Harvard. Which goes to show that if you suckle at the right pipeline, even immigrants get to go to an out-of-touch school for rich kids and become one of them. I mean, this guy must have been drowning in sweater vests, which I guess is the uniform of the American dream. When Chavez gave ExxonMobil the boot and Vecchio was offered a job at Exxon's Qatar offices, he declined to stay in Venezuela to fight the socialization of the oil. Now, he worked with opposition groups to take back the country. He was on the forefront of various coup operations and eventually was exiled from the country in 2014. Later, he's quoted to say that he's been working for Venezuela from afar. Uh, wait, uh, what? How, how do you help a country that you're not even in? Okay, I don't think being a revolutionary or a leader is a telecommuting job. Okay, look, I know you're in D.C. and everybody telecommutes there, but you, but you, but you can't, you can't be the leader of a revolution and telecommute to that. You, you just can't do it. Okay, this is not. You got to be on site, fella. That's part of the job. That's part of being a revolutionary is you got to show up to the revolution. Vecchio, alongside with his compatriots Leonardo Lopez and Juan Guaido, started a pro-business, no-negotiation political organization called Popular Will in the early 2000s. Turns out, this will was only popular with a few people and a lot with a lot of moneyed interests. And in order to pull allegiances away from Chavez, Popular, popular Will was monetarily backed by the USAID and ran regime change operation. And this included guerrilla tactics where they mooned people on the streets of Venezuela. And of course, Guaido was part of the mooning. Popular Will also claimed to be social, dedicated to socialism. You know, because that was the people's ass. Okay, not just Guaido's. And they probably were socialists, but much like America, they're only socialists when it comes to corporations and the private sector. But when it comes to helping the people, it could prove to be disastrous in creating a fair and just society 
where they don't have the majority of the money and power. They went so far as causing civil unrest in the streets of Venezuela. Guaido was part of the violent resistance in 2014, which included running steel wire across the streets to flip motorcycles. Guaido was seen in a tweet and a video with a gas mask and a helmet calling for resistance. And at the end of this, Guaido was dismissive of all the lives lost in this so-called protest. And to the people of Venezuela, that became the defining factor of the popular will. And they did it all over again in 2017 in an attempt to, quote-unquote, resist the Maduro government. Pending an arrest warrant for Lopez and Vecchio, Vecchio disappeared and resurfaced in New York City. Many of the members of the popular will are either seeking asylum in other embassies on house arrest or wanted for terrorism and assassination plots. This is the party that has claimed Venezuela is their country. A party funded by the U.S. to create chaos in order to create the, the change of a regime of a country for the sake of oil. With, with the people that were being paid by the USAID that are now wanted for terrorism, I mean, it really does give a new meaning to the term state-sponsored terror. Wait, no, no, it doesn't. That th this is this is pretty much a a, a real good example of, of that. Despite all of their coup efforts, they couldn't prevent the legal election of Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. During the Obama administration, Vecchio convinced the Organization of American States to say the problems in Venezuela was because of who's currently in power. And after the embassy protectors who were invited by Maduro's government to ensure that Venezuela keeps its sovereignty were ousted by the pro-coup raid earlier this year, Vecchio thanked those that were behind the coup, like Trump, the Secret Service, and the police. Without winning a single vote, he has now become the coup's ambassador to Venezuela. Guaido's wife gave a real stoic speech that would make other dictators shudder in their graves about how the military of Venezuela should rise up and fight Maduro. Obviously, this didn't work. Guaido is currently waiting for his orders to make his next move, and in this coup and regime change, he is an expendable figure. If he fails, he'll just become another ass that the American state fucked. Just a, just a notch on the belt. And this is what Black Max Blumenthal and the Gray Zone Project is being targeted for. Max and all the real journalists at the Gray Zone Project are challenging the nature of empire and the imperial actions of the United States. Now they have false charges, and this will be a, a, a large and long, lengthy legal battle that will go on for a while. But the question is... If they can target a journalist that is going up against the presented narrative from the state, what's to stop them from coming after any one of the citizens of this nation that says and does things that they don't approve of, that's not part of the, the, the approved script that they have for how to behave in this country? This is the time that we the people have to stand up and stand beside Max Blumenthal and the Gray Zone Project and all of the other independent journalism organizations out there to make sure that we're not silenced. I doubt Max will be silenced. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video and uh, checking out this episode of The Dispatch. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a like. Please subscribe and share this episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, uh, if you enjoyed the comedy in this episode, you will probably enjoy my live stand-up comedy. And I've got live stand-up comedy dates coming up in Columbus, Ohio, Louisville, Kentucky, Morgantown, West Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, Asheville, North Carolina, Knoxville, Tennessee, and Johnson City, Tennessee. For my entire tour schedule, you can go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com, to see if I'm coming to a city near you and grab your tickets. Hope to see you guys at a live show. Thanks so much.